Well, hello there, ladies and gents. How the very devil are you? Andy here. Welcome back once again to Andy's Garden Garage. Today, we're going to be doing a bunch of servicing on the CB1000R because we've got a big trip coming up. Got myself this bag of goodies. We're going to be changing the oil, the oil filter, a bit of cleaning, a couple of other bits and bobs. Got a new tire to go on. Going to check the brake calipers and just make sure that everything's tip top. And because the trip is very, very soon, less than five days away, we're going to be going back to the old school. So it's going to be clippy on the baseball cap, camera on the front, just like in the olden days. Going to be no swoopy views, no tripods, I'm afraid. I will do my very best to keep my head still for those of you who said it makes you feel sick. Right, let's get on with it. First on the agenda, for no reason other than I've got an appointment to get the tyre changed in about 45 minutes, is the back wheel. Now, as you can see, this Avon Spirit ST tyre isn't quite at the end of its life. It's still got a little bit left. If I measure that with my old school vernier, uh, we've still got 2.3 millimetres left there. But as the trip is going to be going to Norway, and it's going to be at least three, probably more like 4,000 kilometres, I don't want to be hitting the wear indicators while I'm in the middle of a tour, especially as the weather looks like it's going to be a bit dodgy. Plus. If you look at other places, I've obviously favoured the left-hand corners. We're a hell of a lot closer to the wear indicator here. So I've booked in a brand new Avon Spirit ST. I absolutely loved using this one, so I was happy to splash out the Dosh to get a new one. And it also came in at 145 euros, so about 25 cheaper than a Rode 5, and over 40 euros cheaper than a Rode 6. And if you haven't seen it, do check out my full review of the Avon Spirit STs. Links up in the right, down in the description. So firstly, the exhaust pipe needs to be shoved out of the way. Do that with my trusty and much love wear a tool check plus kit. That's the clamp loosened off. Incidentally, for those of you wondering where the arrow can has gone, I just decided the stock can vibrates less. And to be honest, the noise is barely noticeably different. So I've just gone back to stock and I'll be punting the arrow on to try and make some fuel money in these hard, hard times. You can get away with just rotating this out of the way, but in the interest of access and visibility, I'm gonna take it off completely. Put it over here on the cactus. Actually, before I go any further, furthermore, incidentally, incidentally, furthermore, just see how much tread you get on a brand new Avon Spirit ST. Just shy of eight mil, it's about 7.75. It's a little bit more than two to two and a half, especially when we're gonna be going on a potentially very wet tour. The bit I absolutely love about this bike and its single-sided swing arm. It's so easy to take the whole wheel off. You don't have to worry about touching the brakes, touching the chain. Pop it off and away you go. Give this gopping hoop a bit of a clean. Most of my cleaning stuff like this, I just use these Petek Reinigungstücher cleaning towels, if you like. They're soaked in some goop, which is paint friendly. Takes off most of the goop, including chain oil, I find. So it's a really quick and easy way to clean pretty much anything on the bike off. Because whenever I go to the car wash, there's always bits that I miss because you have to do it in a rush because there's always a queue of super keen Germans behind you who want to polish their car for the 15th time that week. Big business here in Germany, car washes. And I give it a polish with some ProCycle Motorrad Poliervax. Guess it wasn't as clean as I thought it was. Yeah, that's good shit. That's super slippery and shiny. I was thinking about it, maybe polishing it wasn't the greatest idea because it potentially means the counterweights aren't going to stick that great. So now completely counterproductively, I'm going to clean off the wax with some rubbing alcohol. What a plonker, I'll polish it when I've got the new tire on there. The last thing I want is counterweights pinging off into the ether while I'm smashing down Gairanga Ford. Right, that will do, nice and clean. We'll send that off to the tire shop and have it come back in a minute with a new tire on it. Then I can move on to the next step, possibly the most important step, which is the oil change. Let's get some fresh blood in this thing's heart. So first off, we need to run the bike a couple of minutes to get it warm, very antisocially with no pipe on it. That's what a CB1000R sounds like with no end can on at all. I'm pretty sure the FZ1 was louder than that with an end can on. All right, we've got to 77 and it started coming down amazingly, so that'll do. Position my oil collection drum underneath. I'm gonna need an extension for that, I was gonna burn myself. Multiple extensions, one too many. I need to get the arse out of it, eh? Oh, might wanna take the plug out of that. This is what happens when you do anything in a rush, ladies and gents. Just chill out is my advice. It's better to take a bit longer to get it right, to take even longer to fix your mistakes. Right, now I can undo the oil sump and there she blows. Right, so I will leave that to drain out for a bit and we'll move on to the next step. Oh, here comes the wheel back. Lovely stuff, look at that. Right, I'll give that a polish in a second. First, let's get the oil finished. In fact, just put it over there. One of my beautiful workshop assistants can give it a polish while I'm working. Well, it looks like the oil's finished coming out, mostly. But I suppose might as well leave it while I deal with the oil filter. Now, this is actually something that I think Honda have done a good thing with, in that the filter itself is protected by this plastic sheath. So first of all, we just have to pop that off. 
So that is odd. Why has the top bolt got no washers and the bottom bolt has two washers? Could that be a mistake? Anyway, that sheath now pops off. There we go. So hopefully this should be relatively easy to get off without any special tools, having not been gummed up by all the road gunk. We'll see if that theory holds true. No, that's not going to budge. Hype wrench to the rescue. Had this thing in my toolbox for years and barely ever used it. Today could be your moment, my friend. <clears throat> and it is just crushing it, not in a good way. Okay, so that didn't work. I'm gonna have to go for the oldest trick in the book. I never like to do it, but it's must. Screwdriver through the filter. Let the oil drain out of this freshly murdered filter. I don't like to do this because if anything goes wrong and for some reason I can't get this off, this bike is now essentially dead until I go and get myself a filter strap. Amazing how these things get so tight when they're supposed to be like hand tight screwed on. Right, that's down to the last drizzles now. So hopefully I should be able to give this a twist. Oh, that is really on there. Try somewhere else for a bit more leverage. When all else fails, get a comfier seat. Oh, look at that fella. That's a bit of a beast. Come on, there you go. I know you guys watching in Australia will be laughing your asses off at me right now. That's not a spider. I met a spider in the street the other day. He took my wallet, my wife, my three kids, and my ute. Okay, that's mild racism and stereotyping. I do apologize. Yeah, comfier seat. Bigger tools. Oh, there we go. There she blows. Oh, I thought it was empty, but not even close. There we go, that is the Honda filter off. Well, it looks like all the oil's come out of there that's gonna come out of there, so we can get on, put some new stuff back in. We'll take the old sump plug, get rid of the washer on it, because we've got a new one of them. So just one of them, a Kupfer Dicht Ringer. Your mum's a Kupfer Dicht Ringer. Put the washer over the bolt, pop the bolt into my super long arm of extensification. Just dip that tight for now, because I'm gonna get the proper tool. Set to 30 Newton meters of torquage. There we go, that's 30 torques in a greasy socket. Steady on, steady on, this is all mechanical stuff. So with the sump plug tightened down, with a new washer in it. Unpack the new filter from HiQ. Decided I didn't need to put any more money into Honda's coffers. They've had enough from me. But it is unsurprisingly exactly the same in pretty much every way as the Honda filter. What I need to do now is to open up the fresh new oil. Decided that unlike the filter with the oil, I'd go for some good stuff. And I've got some Motul 5100. It's semi-synthetic, but it apparently has a very high synthetic portion of the oil. So that should be good. Right, and we need a splash of this around the seal of the filter. Filter. Make sure that's completely wet. And then also, just to make sure we get a good fill, half fill the filter as well. And then present the filter. Tightened up to as many hand torques as I can manage. That will do nicely. Wipe off the excess. Cleanliness is next to dogliness. Oil filter cover back in place. That fits wonderfully, that's a good sign. For those nipped, move the old oil out of the way. Move that aside, to be disposed of responsibly at a later date. Clean the excess off the pipes, because that's going to stink to high heaven when they get hot again. I think sometimes I enjoy the smell of oil as much as the smell of petrol, but not when it's burning. With that all wiped and clean, we can put the new oil in. Oh, sounded a little bit too excited about that, didn't I? Can put the new oil in. <laughs> so fill a cap off, spill the cloth at the ready, and away we go. Yep. That's not very easy with this stand. It's completely, exactly, perfectly in the way. And then the foot peg as well, brilliant stuff. Really, oh, sake. Right, so that was a disastrous attempt. So I shall try the screwdriver trick. And look at that, actually works. It's gonna take a while, mind. And there's four kilo weight in my right hand. <laughs> it's a bit of a killer. Oh. And we've got to get rid of three litres into the bike because with an oil change without changing the filter, you use 2.7 litres. And for a full oil and filter change, you need three litres. So with that reckoning, by the time I've got one litre left in the bottle, it should be good. All right, that's half a litre. This is going to take a while. All right, so that is up to the top fill line. But I predict that, just as expected, we've only actually got about two and a half, 2.3 liters in there, including what I've thrown all over the engine. Which makes perfect sense, because if I now run the bike for a second, it should fill the filter, and then we'll have to top it up. Give that a second to trickle into the sight glass. Or not. So obviously the distance between the top level and the bottom level on the sight glass is less than half a liter. 
comes. That should be in the bottle now. Yep, slightly less than a litre, which kind of makes sense because I did have a bit of spillage. Fill the cap back on, on the engine for a second again. as it drains back into the sight glass. Make sure we haven't got to top it up again. There we go, perfect. That's settled dead on the top line. So we are good. Oil change is finished. Oh, look at that. The back wheel's nice and polished too. So that means we can get this back on the bike. Ah, oh, but not before. Have a good look at the brake pads. Oh yeah, they look absolutely fine. Plenty of meat left on those. Just for the sake of argument, about four and a half mil left there. It's going to be a long, long time before I have to change them. Also, while I'm in here, I can check the chain slack. This bike is supposed to have 45 mil. And down here, it makes very little sense because it hits the uh, swing arm long before 45 mil. So I can check it up here. Down as far as it'll go, up as far as it'll go, absolutely marvellous. In the manual, it even says 45 to 50. So that's spot on. The little sticker on there says 45, but strange. But that's a bit of a testament to the uh, Totoro chain oiler in there. That's 20,000 kilometers on the chain that the bike came with. And the last time I adjusted this was, I think, before I went to Switzerland. So it's doing its job very well. But just to make sure while we're in here, this little indicator here, as you can see, it's got an indicator that slides along as you adjust the chain by revolving this off-center cam that's in the hub. and. Once this little indicator gets into the red area, it shows that your chain is so stretched that it needs to be changed. And I'm currently about halfway through the green area, so chain is still in good state. Having said that, it has got a couple of tight spots here and there, so it is gonna be getting changed soon, but not today. I'll take a beautiful shiny new tire on the beautiful shiny new wheel. Oh, beautiful shiny newly polished. Finger tight all the bolts on. Oh, the nuts, sorry. The lug nuts which is really odd because they haven't even got ears. Put the bike back in gear again, and they will be tightened to a Herculean 108 newton meters of torque. Just notice actually, it actually says torques on it. So it is 108 torques. Tightening the nuts opposite to each other, keeping the force even across everywhere. Last thing we want is a warped wheel or a bendy hub. So there we go, it's them all torqued. So I can put the pipe back on, just check that the Gasket is in good enough shape. Yep, it's not climbing apart or anything, so we're not going to get any funny blow noises. Although, as you heard, this thing barely makes any noise without a can on it anyway. So, had to happen, didn't it? That's the exhaust clamp nipped nice and tight. So, with the tyre changed, chain slack checked, rear brake calipers checked, pipe back on, oil changed, we can get on change the air filter. I've got to be honest, at this point I'm entering unknown territory. I've never been into the air filter on this bike. I don't have a manual to find out how to do it. So join me on a journey into the unknown. So it was very strangely an Allen headed bolt at the top, a GIS cross headed screw at the bottom, and then off comes the air box cover. Well, the intake cover. Pop this funnel thing out just by pulling on it. it looks like to me that is a fine piece of noise reduction. I might leave that out when I put it back together and see how that sounds because with K and N filter as well, we might be able to get a bit more noise out of this beauty. This is a bolt here, a bolt there, hopefully the same on the other side and I should be able to pull this bottom piece of the air box out. There's one bolt out there. Oh, look at that, would you believe it? I can't get that bolt out when the aluminium cover's in the way. Unbelievable. Okay, now we can finally get that bolt off. And that feels a bit loose already. So let's round to the other side in the roasting sun. That's a bit tighter in here because all of the wiring looms come down this side of the frame. It's a bit tight. Right, that's the bolt out that side. So now theoretically, I should be loose enough to get out. Oh, that's like there's a tongue going into a hole at the front there. So if we slide it backwards a bit on this side, slide it backwards a bit on this side. And then I should be able to just pull that out, I think. Naturally, there's a wiring loom right in the way of it. Oh, here we go, look at this. Pull this loom out of the way of it. Oh, bosh, a bit more room to play with. There's the secret. 
a screwdriver to push this wiring out of the way. Sorry if you can't see any of this, it's all happening keyhole surgery style. And now it's catching all this stuff. Oh, what a palava. Right, there we go. Yeah, so probably the best I can tell you is that you need to push this wire out of the way forwards, you need to push these wires out of the way downwards, and I would honestly say all of that could be a lot better laid flat either side of this bolt so that none of it was an issue. But no, nope, it's not how Honda plays. Anyway, the airbox is out, can put the new filter in. Oh, sounds like it's stopped some rocks already. I'll come over to the shade for this part of the proceedings. So I've got myself a K&N HA 1018, which will hopefully fit my bike. This filter actually cost me 55 euros, which might seem a bit lumpy, but all of the claims about increased horsepower, that kind of stuff, I tend to just mostly ignore. The thing that I'm interested in is the fact that you buy this filter one time, and then in up to 120,000 kilometers, I'll have to take it out and clean it. Probably might do it a little bit more often than that. But yeah, the idea is this filter will last me for the rest of my life. Well, the rest of the life of the bike, at least. And I can already feel it's very greasy, so it's pre-oiled. It means I never have to buy a filter again. And considering these Honda ones, looking around around in official and unofficial areas cost anywhere from 20 to 40 euros. So suddenly 55 isn't all that expensive. So the screws off, filter just lifts out and it is full of crud. And once again, this filter was due to be changed at 24,000 kilometers anyway, so I'm a bit early, but yeah, there we go. Oh, let's put all this rattling. There's a piece of cable tie in there. Mm, I'm hoping I did that at the factory. Right, now I need to do, because amazingly, for your 55 euros, don't get a seal. I have to fish this seal out of the filter somehow, without damaging it, obviously. There we go. Rub that free of any dust and debris. That then needs to be placed in the exact same groove around the edge of the k &N filter cheapskates, eh? Although I'm going to go with sustainability and say I think actually it's quite a good thing that we can reuse a part of the old filter rather than just chucking it all in the bin. That's the seal on. Some little bits of cotton from the filter poking out there. I don't want them getting into the seal and spoiling it. And then I also need to go back to the old filter again, push these captive screws out of their little captive area. Run, you are free! For a short while. Now you're imprisoned again. And then that goes seal side down. In fact, hang on. Tip all of this crap out. I'm also supposed to empty out as part of this service the crankcase breather tube, but it looks like there's barely anything in there, so not really anything to empty out. Keep an eye on that. Maybe I'll empty that out when I get back from Norway. But incidentally, if you did want to empty that, it's nice and easy. You would just undo the little clip here by squeezing those bits together, pull it off, tip whatever's in there into a suitable container, and then stick it back on again. Right then, so prepared filter goes seal side down onto the bottom half of the airbox. Make sure everything is seated nicely. That is the filter fitted, manky old, sporty new. Let's get it back on the bike and see how much of an adventure this is going to be. Look at that. Can pull this wiring out of the way as well. If only I'd known, eh? So that first is the bit at the bottom. And there's a bit at the front. Oh, look at that. That was remarkably easy. And then you slip the little tongues into their little levery bits. So make sure that it's in on this side too. Yeah, and then pops up, screws back together. Oh, back in the roasting sun. I'm really glad that that went nice and quick. I hope I haven't forgotten or missed anything. Stuff all that back under there out of the way. So that's them done. That wiring all goes back in the middle there. Odd that Andra's relying on cables just being wedged between stuff. Doesn't seem very well engineered to me. But there you go, what do I know? And then you would put this trumpet thing back in by hooking in the bottom hook. It pops into the rubber thing, hook over the top hook. But as I said, I'm actually going to leave those out. I don't think it's going to have any effect on the performance other than noise, because it's before the air filter. If these things were after the air filter, on the actual air intakes themselves, the trumpets that go on there have a lot to do with the power where the power is, where the torque is on your engine because of reciprocating pressure waves and all that kind of stuff. But before the air filter, the air is still dirty. So all this is doing is stopping noise by silencing the vibrations of the sound. So let's leave them off, see if we can get a bit more bark out of this beast. So then the cover goes over. So that's that side finished. Oh, almost, but not quite. Oh, it's just reflected the sun directly into my eyes. I can't see a thing now. Putting this together, I feel it's probably best because I'm sweating directly into my eyeballs as well. Right, that is that side actually done now. So, round to the other side. 
there we go, that is the air filter now changed on the CB1000R. That actually went a bit quicker and a bit easier than I expected it to. That part of the job, in fact, only took 45 minutes. Not bad. Right, because I'm paranoid, I'm just gonna start up the machine to make sure I haven't dislodged any wiring or anything that is vital to the running of the bike. Oh, yep, there's the uh, burning oil I talked about. That smells awful. There's maybe a tiny, tiny bit more induction noise, but not really anything to write home about. I have to wait until we get it on full song, wide open throttle to really see how that makes any difference. Right, so that is that job done. It's not a great deal left now. But one thing I do need to do, which I've already done at the back, is to check the brake pads here at the front. And to be honest, I think they're still going to be good. Looks like I've got about a mil and a half left to the wear indicator end. And that's the point at which it's recommended to change the pads. You bear in mind, these pads come with about four and a half, five millimeters of meat to start with. Measure from the edge of the pad there. Yeah, I've got three and a half mil of meat there. That's plenty, considering these are the same pads I've had on since I bought the bike 20,000 kilometers ago. That's going to be plenty enough for a 4,000 kilometer tour. Plus, in Norway, we're not exactly going to be breaking the speed limits. We're not going to be going for the land speed record because the fines are so insane. It's just going to be a nice, relaxed, scenic, twisty, super beautiful ride. And I think that is pretty much it. I mean, there are a couple more things that are due on the 24,000 kilometer service, which will officially be due when we get back from Norway. I need to change the brake fluid because that's already two years old. I need to, oh, that's the point, to check the, uh, the coolant, which on this bike is almost impossible to see. Ah, uh, yep, there it is. Just a tiny bit lower than the, the maximum level. So that is good as far as I'm concerned. And that means that's it. The service is finished of the Honda CB1000R. Thank you so very much for watching. I am very, very, very much looking forward to taking this beastie up into the Norwegian fjords and hills and mountains and twisties. I'm sure that is going to be an absolutely stunning ride and it's happening in just five days time. So watch out for those videos. If you've enjoyed this video, if it's been useful to you, if it's been interesting, please do give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already, get yourself subscribed on the channel so you can catch more videos like this as they arrive and also all the videos of me blasting around on this beautiful, beautiful bike. Otherwise, I've been Andy, keep your shiny, and I'll see you out there. ta -ra.